Welcome to MD Newsline. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and chat with us. Please introduce yourself to our audience. Hello, my name is Dr. Omolara Grace Adeneran, and I'm an endocrinologist. And uh, here I am today. Happy to be here. Great. So tell me about your your work and, and your experience here at the conference so far. Oh, the conference has been wonderful. Uh, every bit of it is so enriching with so much knowledge and new information mm -hmm. out there for one to update one's with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's been a wonderful day. So have there been any sessions in particular that have stood out to you? What has been kind of the most interesting thing you've heard here? Yeah, I would say the lipodystrophy uh, lecture yesterday uh, on Friday. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I needed to know more about the lipodystrophy and how it's related to or how we can differentiate it from cushion because of the way the pattern, the, the way the patient looks like when they have lipodystrophy. And uh, it was a, it has been a challenge for me. And I was happy to see the way the lecture was dealt, uh, handled in detail and they were able to explain to us what how we can actually differentiate patient who has lipodystrophy from patient who have cushion and the management and the treatment and to know that just treating patient with lipodystrophy alone, they can, there are other medical conditions like lipid problem, hypertriglyceridemia can resolve, their diabetes with severe insulin resistance can also resolve. So it's, it's a take home point for me, big one. When it comes to um, your particular practice, what are some of the areas that you kind of um, find there to be kind of gaps in care? What, what are your, what's your typical experience with your patients? And then how has some of the things at the conference this year maybe highlighted uh, some of that or has, has helped you kind of um, get a different perspective on that? Uh, you mean when it comes to patients uh, themselves or with the whole general practice? Both. Either one is fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Well, the use of CGM, it's one thing that is getting more uh, exposed out there where most of my patients, uh, not most, I would say, some patients, they are afraid of use the, the use of technology. They don't want anything attached to their body. And um, when they see the test, like from, to, from the conference, I've learned that you can always like just give them a 10-day trial or a seven day trial and let them see how they are doing on the on the CGM. And this has really helped them to some of my patients to say, okay, I've tested it now, I like it and I really want to go ahead with it. But when it comes to the gap in knowledge, I think awareness is still needed when it comes to patients to for them to know that these technologies are not monitoring them, you know. <laughs> What are some of the strategies that you use when it comes to talking to patients about the use of technology and things like CGMs? So one, I I show them the device itself. So uh, with the demo that we have in the clinic, I show them this is how this looks like. And then I also give them live example of patients who have used it and the benefits. And um, I, I just... Let them make their mind up and see what they want. And I don't enforce it on them. Like I always tell patients, like you can always just try it. If in two days you don't like it, mm. take it out. But I can always assure you that it's not monitoring you because your phone and every other devices are just the same. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, so when we talk about um kind of talking to patients about using things like technology, even adhering to treatment plans. Um, there's a lot of uh, different factors that come into play, whether it's socioeconomic, family structures, and things like that. Um, how are you kind of uh, addressing their particular individual lifestyle situations? What are some of the strategies that you use around that? Um, and then if it's relevant as well, um, how are you working across fields maybe with their GPs and things like that to kind of help patients adhere to treatment plans or adopt um, different things like technology? Uh, that's a tough one and challenging most sometimes because um, one, insurance, you know, when they need a CGM and some really want to get their blood sugar controlled, they really want to be better with their diabetes. But 
then insurance is not covering for them either because they are not on insulin they don't have low blood sugars or they just don't want to cover for one reason or the other and with that that's a big challenge because for me as a provider i can i cannot see the readings in in detail and so they are left with just the finger stick pricking glucose mon glucose monitoring and which many of them be we might tell you oh i forgot to check my finger stick so that is affecting the the detailed management of diabetes that one could have done better with this patient that aside when it comes to family with patients that have diabetes another challenge i've seen is you know the lifestyle what they eat what they drink when they are home and i always try to see if possible patient can come in with any family member your spouse your kids your friend just so when they hear directly from the provider that your diet is very important and most what you eat is likely what you what you are and if that could help in a little way it does help but most of the time it's all dependent patient dependent on that um what would you say in in your practice what what populations do you see um being most susceptible uh to this like are you seeing any particular demographics coming into your office more often than others um no, I I'm not taking the detailed statistics, but I could say that I've had missed because I'm here in Florida and uh, the area, the area, the city that I'm working with, they are mixed, and um, the more that are susceptible, it's hard for me to tell just by number. Mm. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm asking that because, you know, with with some other conversations that we've had, even like depending on um, just the location, uh, there are different maybe like ethnic groups that are in that area. And in particular, whether it's um, kind of their, their general cuisine and things like that, sometimes, you know, certain practices that are built into the culture. Um, sometimes there are uh, uh, groups that end up kind of in I'm thinking about cholesterol specifically, <laughs> talking okay. to a doctor from Texas. Um, so, yeah, sometimes depending on the area, um, those groups kind of show up a little bit more. But it's interesting that that your area kind of stays pretty mixed. Yeah, it's pretty mixed. My area is pretty mixed. I have the Hispanic, the African American, white, and um, mm -hmm. mixed of all. I think it's all all, all about the level of understanding of their medical conditions as well and their uh, standard of living mm -hmm. uh, per family. Uh, but if I want to go in depth, I would say that I had a conversation with one of my patients, African American, and she was more concerned about having access to the the green. Mm. You know, the farmers market is not is not as easy. Mm. Like when if she had been if she's living in a different neighborhood, for instance, and because we had to talk about the green things on the plate. And that was what led to the conversation. And that I know plays a significant role because what they see most often is what they're going to buy and eat. Mm. Yeah. You know, I was, I was thinking just as you mentioned that, of course, there's obviously when we think about socioeconomic status, location, some areas are more obesogenic than others. You know, um, people can't access uh, fresh greens. Um, and then with this whole insurance conversation, that kind of throws an additional wrench in there. How are you navigating around things like food deserts and insurance coverage in general? Like what is what is the fix when someone can't get access to, you know, vegetables? Well, that's tough. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Yeah, because if you can't get access, not just access, and then when you have the access to the food, the cost of the food is also important and they put those into consideration and end up just having to hear what they have on their plate but as an endocrinologist and you want to make sure whatever it takes you control their sugar you you take care of their medical conditions then we i talk more about small portion meal like whatever food you're eating don't eat a bulk of it if Previously, you hit a big plate of, of rice, of bread, and of potatoes, divide it into small portion meal. Help yourself not to eat too much of all this high-carb diet mm -hmm. just to help and keep them healthy. So these have been the alternate way I've uh, been practicing. Mm -hmm. 
when we talk about things like, you know, blood glucose and, and things like that, I find it interesting that a lot of these um, kind of spikes and dips, it's internal, right? So you can never really um, know how it feels in someone's body. We can only kind of describe it. Um, how do you kind of help patients kind of gauge what their body is doing? How do you navigate those conversations to make sure that they kind of get regain a sense? Because if this is something they've been struggling with for a while, maybe sometimes people normalize the feelings that they have. And it's only after a while that doctors like, you're actually not supposed to be feeling this way at this time of the day or this way after you eat this type of meal. Have you come across those conversations and how have you kind of bridged that gap so that the patient can maybe more accurately say what they are feeling or, or just kind of recalibrate if they've been living for a while, you know, feeling something? Yeah, so um, for diabetes, it comes with symptoms, and some comes with awareness of those symptoms. Sometimes they don't; they are not aware of the symptoms. Um, my goal as a physician is to make sure, if for example you, they are having hypoglycemia, that they are aware of the hypoglycemia, and if they are not aware. I had to, that gives me concern because I want to make sure that if your sugar is low, you should be aware of it and that should help you to be able to prevent further complications of hypoglycemia. Uh, when it comes to hypoglycemia, for instance, the symptoms are also out there. Um, for thyroid, for instance, the symptoms are there so they can see, they can feel the symptoms and the, and the like. But most importantly, I monitor them with blood work, you know, because endocrinology, most of what we do, it's requiring blood work. So when they see their blood work three months ago and compare with their blood work this at the present, they see their progress or their regression. And we can have a talk and dialogue. What, what can you do better? This is your blood pressure today. This is your blood sugar today as compared to your blood sugar three months ago, as compared to your thyroid hormone level three months ago. Are you taking your medications as you should? Are you forgetting to take your medications? Are there challenges that you're having in refilling your medications? Is there a problem that anything that we can fix while we dialogue? So it all comes down to having to listen to them and uh, Pay attention to patient because they say a lot. Patients will tell you many keys that you can understand where you can help them out. Yeah. So and from there, um, we've been able or I've been able to be able to bring out solutions mm. and applaud them, encourage them when they are progressing. And if they have any thing that they are worried about, uh, we can discuss it that as well in detail. Um, other thing I would say is that when they feel like they are, they, they've tried and still no improvement that you sh that sometimes can happen because, you know, medical conditions like diabetes sometimes can be very challenging when they've given all the, the, they want to do, they've tried their diet, they've taken their medications and still the, the disease is progressing or they are not feeling better. At that point, I let them understand, like, it's, it, it's okay. Life can be very challenging to uh, address things. And then we talk more in detail on how else we can help out. So it's all more boils down to having to listen to them more, mm -hmm. see little areas and big areas that we can adjust. Is there any aspect of that conversation that's particularly more challenging for the patients to really understand and conceptualize when you talk about numbers with them or test results? Uh, that, I, I don't think so, mm -hmm. no. Yeah, because w numbers can be scary. Sometimes they don't understand the numbers. But when you let them understand, like, listen, if your blood sugar, for instance, A1C, which is what we check and monitor for diabetes, if your A1C is above the goal you should you you might be experiencing complications or symptoms like numbness tingling uh your high sight might be getting more blurry and these are signs that you need to correct your sugar so and if you can work on your blood sugar your a1c improves and if your a1c improves you will feel better and so they have that in mind 
they have that goal to run. And when they come back in three months, six months down the line, they tell you, since I've improved on this area, my numbness has improved. My I can now see clearly or see clearer than before. And my sugar numbers have also come down to this level. And so they see they, they now they can correlate the numbers with their symptoms and their general well being at at large. That's great. I think that's a great point to end on. Any um, kind of last thoughts around improving patient care? Anything that we haven't covered? Um, family support is important when it comes to patient care, especially chronic medical conditions like diabetes, like thyroid, cholesterol, obesity. Um, obesity has been something that well, I'm happy as a, as an endocrinologist that we have medications and treatments for obesity now. Uh, but that also has been a challenge with insurance, with having to help them get controlled. I, I believe um, if we can work more on helping patients on lifestyle modifications and compliance with medications and um, taking a baby step one day at a time, they can always achieve their goal and they can stay healthy in that direction. Thanks for joining us on MD Newsline. This has been an amazing conversation.